TLO, what's pop? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe. Turn on the post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. This is where all the lives will go if we have any highlights and you happen to miss them. Don't forget, we also got the Patreon. That's where we post stuff where we can't post on YouTube or anything that gets blocked and we can't do it. We put it here. And don't forget, we also got the Discord. Y'all yeah, don't know what the Discord is, right? Um, to get to any of these, go to the description underneath the video. And there's a link in the bio or the description. You just click it. It'll take you to everything. Now, this is Alan Turing. Turing. The Enigma. I honestly don't know who this is. Well, let's check it out. Then. This is very random. Possible by Backblaze. Get a free 15 day trial at Backblaze. Imagine for a second that there exists a hero, a man who has served his country in its darkest hour and has made great scientific breakthroughs, who may have saved as many as 14 million lives. How would you reward this man? Would you give him riches, awards, accolades? Or would you hound him from your institutions? Would you destroy his relationships before finally driving him to suicide? In 1954, the British government, they made the latter choice. That hero's name? Alan Turing. His crime? Refusing to live in the closet. A mathematical prodigy, Alan Turing escaped a troubled childhood to become perhaps Britain's greatest mathematician. The father of modern computing, he pioneered concepts of artificial intelligence and cryptography and saved millions of lives as a codebreaker in World War II. He okay. also dared to be openly gay at a time when loving another man could see you not just jailed, but destroyed by the establishment. Join us today. So Alan Turing was a mathematical prodigy who saved millions of lives, but was an open community member back in the 50s, 60s. Ooh. As we journey through the inspiring life and the tragic death of the mathematician who took on the Nazis and won. That's crazy, the mathematician who took on the... To have love and lost. It is said the first person we fall in love with influences us for the rest. It is said the first person we fall in love with influences us for the rest of our lives. Perhaps that's never been more true than in the case of Alan Turing. I ain't never heard that. Makes sense though. When the teenage Turing met Christopher Morkin in 1928, it was the start of a relationship that would drive Turing to do his greatest work. So it's really remarkable how close this meeting never came to happening. There are near infinite universes out there where the father of computing never met the muse who would inspire him. The first branching of the multiverse came in 1912, when Ethel Stoning discovered she was pregnant with Julius Turing's second child. At the time, Julius Turing was a functionary in the Indian Civil Service, and there was no reason to believe the new baby would grow up anywhere but amid the heat and humidity of the Indian Plains. But this okay. was 1912. Serious unrest was starting to break out against the British Raj, and Julius decided that his child would be safer growing up in Britain. And so it was that on June the 23rd, 1912, Alan Matheson Turing was born not in Andhra Pradesh, but in London. Still, India would powerfully affect young Alan's life. Although Julius wanted his children raised in Britain, his job required him and Ethel to live in India. So in 1913, they went back, leaving Alan and his brother John in the charge of Colonel Ward. To compare Ward to the drill sergeant in full metal jacket it would be a bit of an understatement. Ward That's what I'm saying. I heard, I heard. I heard the they name back, and I'm like, oh man. Leaving Alan and his brother John in the charge of Colonel Ward. And Colonel World, World, Ward. To compare Ward to the drill sergeant in full metal jacket it would be a bit of an understatement. Ward was a true military man. He liked boys who stood to attention, not sissies like young Alan who preferred reading to Raga. As a result, Alan's early years were spent constantly being bellowed at until Ethel finally returned to England and decided Alan would fare better at boarding school. And it's at this point that we get our second great branch in the multiverse. In 1925, at age 13, Alan arrived at the prestigious Sherborne boarding school 
endorse it. By now, the boy was a veritable maths prodigy. Unfortunately, Sherborne was a school that prided itself on Latin and Bible studies. St How do you just like, like, like we went from an unknown age to 13. Like how, like I'm wondering how, what makes you become a mathematician? Like what makes you great at math all of a sudden? It's just something in your brain that click. There gotta be something that's just given to you. Because math is not my strong suit. I'm out, I'm okay with it, but I ain't the greatest, you feel me? Stuff that Alan kind of sucked at. He sucked so bad, in fact, that the school actually opted to expel him. It was only after some serious begging from Ethel that Alan was allowed to stay. That decision would prove important when in 1928, Alan finally met Christopher. Christopher Morecambe was an attractive lad with a cheeky grin in the year above him at Sherborne. He was also a serious maths enthusiast. The moment Alan first saw Christopher, it was like time had stopped. He took to following the older boy around, always sitting next to him in class. At first, his behavior, it seemed to have amused Christopher. But as the weeks passed, he and Alan began spending time together, debating geometry and conducting science experiments. Before long, they were inseparable. It wasn't exactly a romance. Alan would write in later letters that Christopher was probably aware of his young friend's romantic feelings, but he had no desire to act on them. Yes, it is sort of that classic story of a young gay man falling for his straight best friend. But it didn't matter. Alan never- I'm gonna be real with you, sir. I've never heard that story. I didn't know that was a classic. Me personally, I didn't know. became bitter about this unrequited love. He was just happy being in the same room as Christopher. As 1928 became 1929 and then 1930, the bonds between Alan and Christopher only deepened. Alan's grades, they even improved, and the danger of expulsion, it drifted away. And then came February the 7th, 1930, and this idyllic life, it was shattered into a million jagged pieces. That day, the tuberculosis that had afflicted Christopher mm. since childhood, it went into overdrive. Took he collapsed. It said that the moment he heard the news, Alan RIP Christopher. had a premonition of his love's death. On February the 13th, 1930, Christopher Morecambe died, not yet even 18. In assembly, the headmaster gave a heartfelt speech to mark his pardon. Wait, what? Not yet even 18. In assembly, the headmaster gave a heartfelt speech to mark his passing. But for Alan, what use were mere words? He'd lost the one person in the world who mattered to him, the one beautiful thing in his life. From that day on, Alan Turing had simply never be the same again. The nature of the spirit. As 1930 first dawned on the rolling hills of Dorset, Alan Turing had been an aimless student and a committed Christian. By the time that fateful year retreated over the horizon, he was neither of those things. Christopher's yeah, about to say. His death had hit Turing like a haymaker to the stomach. He cut himself off from his religion, began trying to scientifically prove the existence of ghosts, anything to give him hope that his one love hadn't been erased from existence. I worshipped the grounds he trod on, Turing wrote to Christopher's mother. It was no exaggeration. For the rest of his life, Turing would always remember the first boy he fell for. But life it goes on. In 1931, Turing left Sherborne and enrolled at King's College, Cambridge, where he studied maths and dabbled in anti-war politics. Yet, even here, the ghost of Christopher, it was never far away. In 1932, Turing wrote Nature of the Spirit, a hopeful essay that attempted to use the brand new field of quantum mechanics to suggest that our spirits might live on in eternity. Turing was still clearly in the denial stage of It's like Marvel, Ant-Man tragedy, but this flirtation with the otherworldly, it wouldn't go to waste. The papers Turing studied during this period would directly influence his later work. The next few years, they passed in numbed heartbreak. At Cambridge, Turing had his first sexual encounters with other boys. He also earned a first degree in mathematics. Aged 22 in 1935, he was even made a fellow. Finally, that same year, the broken young man discovered a reason to keep on living. In 1935, Turing began working on a famous maths problem using some of the ideas that he'd cultivated while researching nature of the spirit. One year later, in 1936, he finished his masterpiece on computable numbers with an application to the Einstein problem. Sorry about my German there. But don't let this name put you off. You're still living with the insights of this paper to this very day. The actual point of Turing's paper is really beyond the scope of the video today, but part of it revolved around a thought experiment using something called a Turing machine. To create the thought experiment, Turing proved how you could take the then human process of computing numbers and create a machine capable of doing the same. That's right. So like a calculator. 
Turing invented a calculator? As a byproduct of solving a maths problem, Turing invented the basis for modern digital computers. This was. Oh, oh computers! Holy, I'm thinking I'm keeping it basic. I'm, okay, computers. It was a truly dazzling step of mathematical logic, a real once-in-a-lifetime achievement. It was also thought to be hopelessly hypothetical, something that was theoretically sound, but nothing that any modern human could ever hope to build. Yeah, the technology didn't catch up yet, but when the technology kept it, the technology caught up, boom. I'm pretty sure there's real ideas floating around like that currently, that the technology can't meet the demands of what's needed, you know. Nonetheless, Turing moved from Cambridge to Princeton, New Jersey in September of 1936 to keep working on his concept. While he was in the USA, he happened to catch an animated film at the cinema. Friends later said the mathematician was completely bowled over by Disney's Snow White, particularly the scene where the Wicked Queen makes an apple deadly by dipping it in a cauldron while whispering, dip the apple in the brew, let the sleeping death seep through. And that, my friends, that's what we call foreshadowing. In 1938, Turing finally returned to the UK, where he picked up a job with GCCS, the pre-World War II British Signals in Deception and Code Cracking branch. He was originally only going to stay there for a year. In fact, in summer of 1939, Turing was offered a teaching job at a university. But as your law re well, I don't know, teaching job at a university, that wouldn't fulfill you. But you know, summer of 1939 was when the fate of Europe changed forever. It was right. at this point that Turing was really only weeks away from a meeting with destiny. I'm not going to lie, I've learned way more about history after school than during school. It's more interesting now. In school, that, maybe it was the way they was teaching it, but it was not interesting. Like, all you wanted to do was go in class and get a D so you can graduate. For me, at least. But, like, nowadays... The Enigma. All right, so it's time for us to rewind the clock back a little on our story, all the way back to 1918. <laughs> so, 1918. At this point, young Alan Turing is still dealing with parents who vanished to India at the drop of a hat and has never even heard of Sherborne or Christopher Morecambe. But it's not Alan Turing we've time traveled here to look at. It's an anonymous looking German man named Arthur Scherbius. In February 1918, as the First World War still raged, Scherbius had quietly filed a patent for a new cipher machine. Looking like a typewriter, the machine randomly scrambled messages as you input them, producing gibberish that only someone with their own copy of both the machine and the cipher key could possibly decode. Scherbius named the machine the Enigma. In two short decades, it was going to be infamous. Scherbius originally wanted the Enigma on the commercial market, but it wasn't long before the military came calling. No surprises. In it doesn't even sound like it has any commercial use. Like, what app, What application would you use that for? Even in the 30, even now, like, commercially, what I need that for? Everything's already encrypted. I mean, but back then, I mean, I guess, but... It sounds like something for the military. 1926, while Turing was close to getting his ass expelled from the Sherborne, the German Weimar Army purchased the Enigma plans and started developing their own, even harder to crack version. This was worrying to Germany's neighbors for obvious reasons. In 1930, the year Christopher died, Polish intelligence began secretly trying to collect information on the new cipher machine. In 1933, they got their break. A drunk playboy in the German cipher office named Hans Thilio Schmidt sold information on the Enigma to the French Secret Service. They passed it on to the Poles, and under the direction of mathematician Marian Rewski, Polish intelligence was able to construct their own Enigma device, the Bomber. The Bomber wasn't perfect. It could decipher a lot of Enigma traffic, but it relied on the Germans not updating their methods. When 1938 ended with Hitler annexing Austria and the Czech Sudetenland, the Poles began to worry that maybe they needed to show some other nations their stolen device. In summer of 1939, Polish intelligence, they finally passed on a replica Enigma to both France and Britain. This was a decision they made just in time. On September the 1st, 1939, panzer tanks rolled into Poland. By the time a month had passed, the entire Polish state had been conquered by Germany and Russia, Damn. and Britain and France had declared war. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking about they got that off in the nick of time. 
everything happens how it's supposed to happen. If they wouldn't have gave that up, it would have been destroyed or it would have been found out. And things wouldn't have turned out the way they have turned out and things of that nature. So back in our main narrative, Alan Turing responded to the outbreak of war by reporting to Bletchley Park, the hub of all British code-breaking efforts. There, already waiting for the young maths whiz, was the Pole's last gift before they were conquered, that replica enigma that Turing would use to save millions of lives. Now, just before we get into the rest of the story today, I do want to thank our sponsor, Backblaze, who make these long... No, I like to try... In fact, I... As being synced with... My computer. I understand you gotta pay the bills, but hey. There's also backing stuff up anymore. I can not pay mine. That if I. They will eat hard disk. Hands is of back. How long is the promo? Now, Turing cracked that support this show, which is great. And let's get back to our story and how Turing cracked that code. So at this point in the story, you might be feeling a little confused. If Bletchley Park already had a replica Enigma machine, well, why did they need Turing? The problem was that Enigma's ciphers, they were constantly changing. The Polish machine could intercept its traffic, but without that day's cipher, it was semi-useless. What Bletchley Park needed was a device that could crack the Enigma code, no matter the cipher, and do it quickly. This is where Turing's strange genius came in. Now, you may have seen the Benedict Cumberbatch film about Turing's life called The Imitation Game and have a vision of Alan The, uh, the, imi the Imitation Game. Gotta watch that one. Imitation. And Turing as a borderline Asperger's loner obsessed with maths at the expense of all else. But the real Turing, it wasn't like that. Well, maybe a little. I mean, it's certainly true that he used to chain his mug to the radiator so no one else could drink out of it and it wear a gas mask in summer to keep his hay fever at bay. But he was also a fan of socializing and he liked to go out drinking and dancing with his colleagues. So while Turing certainly was a spooky maths genius while at Bletchley Park, please don't picture him as a 1940s version of Sheldon Cooper. It's just not like that. Nah, uh, Sheldon. Now, the early going work on Enigma was heavy. Although Turing helped build a machine known as the bomb with an E to help decipher intercepted messages, many of them only came through as gibberish or what turned out to be nursery rhymes the Germans had sent as tests. As 1940 got underway, Turing was reassigned to Hut 8, where he led a team tasked with decoding German naval transmissions. This was important for two reasons. The first was that as an island, Britain had to import its food to survive. Great when you've got a friendly continent on your doorstep, less great when German U-boats are sinking all of the maritime traffic coming to the UK. True. The second important reason is that it was in Hut 8 that Turing first met Joan Clark. If Christopher was the great love of Turing's life, Joan was the great friendship. A mathematical genius, Joan had volunteered her talents at Bletchley Park, only to be told that women can't do maths and she would have to take a job as a secretary. Within days, though, it had become clear to even the knuckle-dragging Neanderthals running the place that Joan's brain was the sort of brain they were desperately looking for, and she was promoted to Hut 8. But as this was still the 1940s, Joan was still paid a fraction of what her male colleagues earned. Still, she and Turing, they really hit it off. They went to the cinema together and they went out dancing. As bombs rained down on southern England, the two mathematicians' friendship it began to blossom until, in early 1941, Turing did something unexpected. What? He proposed to Joan. Now, since you've watched... That's out of nowhere. He's still in the closet, though, ain't he? He's trying to conform to society's box. You know what I'm saying? Instead of being himself at this point, right? This far and heard all about Christopher, you're probably wondering why a gay man like Turing would propose to a straight woman like Joan. Joan kind of wondered it too. She knew Turing was gay, but she still said yes. It took a disastrous romantic vacation for them to face reality and call the whole thing off. Still, Joan and Turing, they remained firm friends. Better still, they remained excellent co-workers in Hut 8. And Hut 8 in 1941 was the nerve center for the British fight back against Hitler. That summer, Turing and his colleagues developed a technique known as Banbarismus, which broke the naval enigma codes wide open. Suddenly, the British knew where the U-boats were. Ships could be rerouted, supply lines could be kept open, and lives could be saved. Looking back, it's really quite difficult to picture just how close Britain came to starvation in 1941. We see the course of World War II today like a narrative that can't be changed with... 
That's crazy, bro. You are, when I think when I used to think of war, I would just think of soldiers on a front line fighting a battle. But like all of this stuff going on behind closed doors, like is is way more interesting than guns being fired. I ain't even gonna lie to you. Yes, yes, the soldiers are very important, but this stuff right here, the like logistics of it all is kind of cool. I feel. I ain't even gonna hold you. That's what wars are won in Hut 8, clearly. Plucky Britain standing alone, always destined to triumph. But just as there are other universes where Turing never met Christopher, there are other universes where Hut 8 never managed to crack those naval codes and Britain starved in a brutal siege. That fall in 1941, buoyed by their success, the team at Hut 8 wrote to Winston Churchill asking for more funds. They only asked for a little, thinking the great man could never possibly have heard of their small team and what they were up to. So imagine their surprise when Churchill wrote back on October the 21st saying that Hut 8 would now have access to any amount of resources they needed with the utmost urgency. Even the Prime Minister knew that Turing and his team were going to be the ones that saved Britain. So this little Churchill knew what was up. It was like, yeah, we got to give them what they need. Days of victory. By early 1942, Bletchley Park analysts were decoding, on average, one German message every two minutes, or around 84,000 a month. Yet, even as they saved millions of lives and helped decisively turn the war, the team were forbidden from telling anyone about their achievements. As a result, that makes sense. You don't want them. You don't want like spies to know, or anybody to get information and pass it on. Like, hey, they know. They're decoding your messages, of course. That makes sense. Many suspected the Hut 8 team of refusing to help the war effort. Turing's landlady actually accused him of malingering and called his refusal to enlist a disgrace. Among people in the know, though, Turing's reputation, it was soaring. In December of 1942, he was cleared for travel to the USA and given a top-secret security clearance to help American codebreakers. But by March 1943, he had been recalled to Bletchley Park as he was just too invaluable to be away in America. As 1943 became 1944, the tide of war began to turn. In the summer of 1944, D-Day dislodged the Germans from their once unassailable position in France. What followed was a slow motion. D-Day dislodged the Germans from their once unassailable position in France. What followed was a slow motion collapse of the Third Reich that killed more people than perhaps any other war in history. With his work wrapping up, Turing began to make plans for his post-war career. He decided that he might build a universal computer. Around this time, okay, back to the CPU. He also seems to have decided to start living mostly out of the closet. Turing was now a hero, a man whose work had saved Britain from starvation. I mean, who could possibly object to a war hero? Man, it's still 1950. Who just happened to love other men. Finally, in August of 1945, 1945, my bad. Nearly three months after the collapse of Nazi Germany, Japan formally surrendered to the Allies. The Second World War, it was over. For Turing, this meant an OBE, one of Britain's highest honors. It also meant being told to never, ever reveal what had done at Bletchley Park. Not that Turing cared. He was a hot property now, a genius that everyone was clamoring for. In 1946, the National Laboratory commissioned him to build the first modern computer, the ACE. Had it been finished, it would have been the most powerful early computer by far. Sadly, though, the NPL balked at the cost and decided to build a smaller version known as the Pilot ACE. While the Pilot ACE was a milestone in computing, it was overshadowed by the Royal Society Computing Machine Laboratory at Manchester's own effort, the first working electronic stored digital computer. In 1948, Turing quit the NPL and moved to Manchester to join them. It was around this time that... Of course, they're making moves that he want to make and not being worried about the money. Julius Turing finally died. Turing's father had quit the Indian civil service many years before, but had mostly lived abroad for tax reasons. When he died, it was discovered that he'd rewritten his will to leave far more money to Turing than to his brother John. Like the gentleman he was, Turing disregarded his father's wishes, and the two brothers shared their inheritance equally. The 1950s dawned on a it's real brotherhood. I felt that. flurry of activity for Alan Turing. In 1948, the mathematician nearly competed at the London Olympics, making the shortlist for the marathon event. In 1950, he created the famous Turing test for determining if a machine has human-level intelligence. Finally, in 1951, he began working on the creation of artificial life, one of the very first people to do so. 1951 they've been working on this? 49 plus 23 is... You know what I'm saying? I already told you my math wasn't that great. 
72 years they've been working on artificial intelligence. And now when I, when I open up Snapchat, I got an AI. That's crazy. AI is everywhere. Thanks, Torin. All in all, things were going pretty well for Turing now. He was respected in his profession, mildly famous as a mathematician, and living as close to openly gay as was possible in the 1950s. Now, you'll no doubt recall that we started this video by describing Turing's life as tragic. Well, buckle up, because it's time for this innocent man to be brutally destroyed. Did all up for your country and still gonna do a crime was cooking. I'm not surprised. I can't believe it's a little bird on my, my balcony making all that noise like that. Hey! In the weeks before Christmas 1951, Alan Turing was out shopping in Manchester when he happened to lock eyes with Arnold Murray. A young man of around 19, Murray was a good-looking, working-class lad. That same day, Turing took him out to lunch and charmed him. A week later, Murray stayed the night at Turing's house. Soon, the pair were seeing each other regularly. It was during one of these romantic weekends that Murray started complaining that he was always short of cash. Turing offered the boy some money, but Murray refused. The next morning, Turing discovered money missing from his wallet. Although he confronted Murray, the boy claimed he was innocent and the two reconciled. And that was the pattern for the next few weeks, Turing's money disappearing and Murray refusing to admit his guilt. It's likely the- Why would he do that when he offered him to? That's pride. Man, he offered me money, I can't take it, but I'ma steal it. The well-paid Turing could have lived with this odd arrangement, were it not for what happens next. On January the 23rd, 1952, Turing returned home to find his house had been burgled. Deciding Murray had gone too far this time, he called the police. A week or so later, on February the 2nd, 1952, Murray unexpectedly turned up on Turing's doorstep, screaming, that he was innocent. He claimed a friend of his named Harry had been the burglar and that he'd targeted Turing after Murray admitted that the pair were in a gay relationship. Perhaps wanting to believe his lover, Turing reported this new information to the police. Not long after, cops arrived at Turing's house. Turing was asked if this was about Harry. And it was, but not in the way that he thought. Unknown to Turing, the police had already arrested Harry. When Harry told them Turing was in a sexual relationship with Murray, the police decided Harry wasn't the real criminal here. The real criminal was Alan Turing. That same day, Turing was arrested on a charge of gross indecency of having sex with another man. Murray was arrested alongside him. In late February... Wow. 1952, the pair attended a preliminary hearing together. Turing was bailed. Murray went to jail. As a war hero used to moving in academic circles, it's likely Turing never realized anyone would care that he was gay, but the law had said otherwise. In the 1950s, it was routine for police to spy and entrap gay men. You could have saved Britain from starvation in World War II, you could have helped defeat the Nazis, but if you weren't 100% straight, then you were worse than a common burglar. In Mar that That's crazy. I'm not gonna lie. Shout out to all the community members, man. Y I ain't know y'all was, I ain't know it was that deep. In March 1952, Turing pled guilty to one count of gross indecency. The court sound like he's sound like Turing steps so y'all could run. Court originally planned to jail him, but his lawyers convincingly argued that Turing's work was of national importance. In the end, Turing was offered a choice: one year in prison or chemical castration. Damn! Bro, that's wild. He chose chemical castration. A course of female hormones were released into his body via an implant in the thigh. Chemical castration, it was designed to destroy libido and leave you impotent. It also had horrific side effects. An increased risk of cancer was one and extreme depression was another. When the news broke of Turing's conviction, he had his security clearance revoked. His clearance for traveling abroad, it likewise went in the trash. The years of Turing the genius were over. In the eyes of the British establishment, he was now nothing but a monster. That's crazy. It was a cold, wet Monday morning when Alan Turing's housekeeper let herself into his home on June the 8th, 1954. It was now over two years since the mathematician's trial and conviction for homosexuality and Turing's life it was in tatters. Turing's public outing had caused a rift with his family. Turing thought his brother John was trying to hide the fact that he had a homosexual sibling and his mother's reaction to Turing's sexuality had been cold 
and dismissive. Come on, you know my oh well, you y'all wasn't really in his life though. Yeah, I was supposed to know stuff like that. At the same time, the course of hormone treatment had wreaked havoc on his brain and his body. While under treatment, Turing had a small number of sex dreams that convinced him that he was turning straight. He wrote to a friend, I've had a dream indicating rather clearly that I am on the way to being hetero, though I don't accept it with much enthusiasm. Still, by 1954, the worst was generally thought to be behind him. In April 1953, the implant had been removed from Turing's thigh, ending his hormone course. A month later, he had picked up a new job at the cutting edge of computing. There had even been a sort of reconciliation with his mother. While their relationship never fully recovered, it had come back from the lows of the trial. As the housekeeper crept through the house that rainy morning in 1954, she had no reason to suspect that anything would be unusual. The only sign she might have noticed was the faint whiff of bitter almonds on the air. Upstairs, the door to Turing's lab was open. He'd had it installed some years before and spent his spare time experimenting with different chemicals. But the housekeeper hardly noticed she was too busy staring at what lay on the bed. His eyes closed, and in Turing lay dead on the bedsheets, a half-eaten apple beside him. The coroner's report would later claim that he had laced the apple with cyanide and bitten into it, committing suicide in a ghoulish homage to Snow White. Today. It's generally thought to be an unresolved question whether Turing killed himself or accidentally poisoned the apple with cyanide gas while working in his lab. However, a recent exhibition at London's prestigious Science Museum published the original coroner's report for the first time in full. It noted that there was so much cyanide in Turing's stomach that accidental ingestion was effectively impossible. The apple, the coroner reasoned, was a last meal, a final treat to take away the bitter almond taste of cyanide. On June the 12th, 1954, Alan Turing was cremated at Woking Cemetery. Despite his heroic wartime record, despite his pioneering scientific work, the press barely marked his passing. He was just another dead pervert. What did anyone care? 13 years after Alan yeah, I ain't even gonna lie, they bogus for that. Turing died in 1967. The British government finally decriminalized homosexuality in England and Wales. 42 years later, in 2009, Prime Minister Gordon Brown issued a formal apology to him. Finally, on Christmas Eve 2013, the Queen posthumously pardoned Alan Turing. This led to the creation of Turing's Law, which came into effect on January 31, 2017, and posthumously pardoned thousands of gay and bisexual men who were convicted for their sexual orientation in Britain. It was a hard I ain't know nothing about none of this. Hot fight. A cadre of conservative MPs tried to filibuster the bill, falsely claiming that it would pardon convicted paedophiles. Even in the 21st century, the prejudice which destroyed Alan Turing, it still hasn't completely faded. Today it's estimated that Turing's work on Enigma may have shortened the war by two years, saving millions of lives in the process. His work on computing, artificial intelligence, artificial life, and many other fields is considered to have been pioneering. Without this one remarkable man who met such a tragic end... Sounds like he saved lives in multiple ways. You know what I'm saying? Touring law, made computers, decoded uh, Nazi codes. He, he did a lot. <laughs> you and I would be living in a very different world. I'm surprised they don't got Touring Day. In the UK. So I really surprised they don't got a day for him. Till I leave a like, comment, subscribe. I ain't know nothing about this. This is eye opening.